Oh no. And the webinar has now started. There's so many participants. <laughs> All right. Let's give it a couple of seconds for folks to kind of filter in here, and then we will get started talking about all of the slutty things. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Yeah, we've had we had several people at the bookstore today come in and ask specifically, like, where's your smuttiest books? And I'm like, well, I'm glad you asked. And we got to lead them over to our very large romance section, which has expanded like weirdly large over the last like two months. It's been really nice. We had to move memoirs to make room for rom more romance. It's great. So. Any more escapism these days, I think. Oh, absolutely. One thousand percent. One thousand percent. I'm here for so. it. I support it. Fabulous. All right. So it's 7.01, so let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are so happy to have you here this evening. Uh, happy Bookstore Romance Day Eve. Um, tomorrow, of course, is Bookstore Romance Day. It's the fourth year of this independent bookstore holiday celebrating the romance genre. Um, so you should definitely find your local bookstores tomorrow and see if they're participating or join in on some of the great virtual panels that will be happening. And of course, thank you to Billy Blaybaum for creating this excellent holiday. Shout out to Billy. We love you. All right. So I am Emily Halshrone. I'm the co-owner of Main Street Books in St. Charles, Missouri, and an all-around romance enthusiast. We are here tonight to discuss what is, in my opinion, one of the best categories of romance, which is fantasy. Yay! So new epic fantasy is all about the hot romance. What makes romance hot these days? Representation, sex positivity, and inclusion. Best-selling authors Piper J. Drake, Claire Legrand, Maxim Martineau, Anna Aguirre, and Piper CJ are paving the way for a new generation of fantasy romance books that puts lead characters who know their minds and their own journey at the center of the story. Just a note, we are discussing very mature themes during this panel, so lots of sexy times, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll also probably cuss a lot, so if this does not sound like your jam, you've been forewarned. Huge, huge thank you to Sourcebooks Casablanca and to Bloom Books for hosting this panel. We are so grateful to them for the use of their Zoom and for organizing everything. You guys are fabulous and wonderful. We love your books. We love your authors. So grateful to you guys tonight. And just to make everybody aware, we have a zero tolerance harassment policy for virtual events. We expect all event attendees to maintain an atmosphere of respect. Anyone who violates the standard of behavior, including but not limited to engaging in any form of harassment, speech, images, videos, songs, or otherwise, may at the discretion of the organizers be immediately removed from the event and barred from further entry. The severity of the offense may also result in a permanent ban from all future virtual events hosted by Main Street Books. So in short, please don't be a dick. We're happy that you're here. Don't be a dick. All right. With all of the housekeeping out of the way, I would love to introduce our author panel this evening, starting by starting with Piper J. Drake. Uh, Piper J. Drake is a best-selling author of romantic suspense, paranormal romance, science fiction, and fantasy. She's foodie, wander, usually not lost. Piper aspires to give her readers stories with the taste of the hard challenges in life, a breath of laughter, a broad range of strengths and weaknesses, the taste of kisses, and the heat of excitement across multiple genres. Welcome. We're going to be referring to Piper J. Drake as PJ this evening because by some miracle, we have two Pipers on this panel, which is very, very exciting, but a little bit. Twice the fun, double trouble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love double trouble. Double the Pipers, double the fun. Fabulous. All right, moving on to Claire Legrand. Claire Legrand used to be a musician until she realized she couldn't stop thinking about the stories in her head. Now she is the New York Times bestselling author of 11 published novels with more on the way. Fury Born, an epic fantasy novel for young adults, debuted at number four on the New York Times bestseller list and is the first book in the Imperium trilogy. She also writes YA horror and spooky middle grade novels. The first book in her debut adult series, The Middle Miss Trilogy, will release in spring 2023. I will ask you so many questions about that, Claire, just be forewarned. When not writing, Claire enjoys trending, excuse me, tending to her many plants, learning about fashion and interior design, and quoting Star Trek to anyone who will listen. Yay, Claire, we're so happy to have you, especially with I'm your, so happy to be here. well, your adult debut is coming up and this is very exciting. So we're going to talk about, uh, it's like Bridgerton meets Akatar. So like, there's been lots of really good, really good hype for this. So we'll have, we'll have good discussions about that. So excited. All right. <laughs> yes, I know it's going to be great. All right. Next on the list is Maxim Martineau. Maxim Martineau is a staff writer and editor by day and a fantasy author by night. When she's not getting heated over broken heart, she enjoys playing video games, binge watching television shows, competing in just about any sport, and of course, reading. Her favorite Pokemon is a tie between Ninetales and Dratini, original 150 only. Following her passion, Maxim earned her bachelor's degree in English literature from Arizona State University. Maxim, welcome. It, I'm, we're going to have to 
Well, we're going to have to talk about Pokemon in conjunction uh, with, with Beast Trainers or Beast yeah. Trainers as well, because I mean, it seems very, seems very, you know, inspired by. So we'll have a conversation about that. Weird. Too. Weird that. Weird. <laughs> All right. Piper CJ comes next, the author of bisexual fantasy series, The Night and Its Moon. Piper CJ is a photographer, hobby linguist, and French fry enthusiast, aren't we all? She has an MA in folklore and a BA in broadcasting, which she used in her former life as a morning show weather girl, hockey podcaster, and in audio documentary work. When she isn't playing with her dogs, Arrow and Applesauce, she's making TikToks, studying Vietnamese, or writing fantasy very, very quickly. I know, Piper, that your dogs are outside to prevent them from saving you from the ghosts. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise they'd be barking the entire time we're we're talking. It was very, I mean, like, you know, you're on Zoom. It's very exciting. They have to contribute to the conversation. Mm-hmm. They're the star of the show. Yeah. All right. And rounding out our star studded fivesome, Anne Aguirre, New York Times and USA bestselling author. Anne Aguirre has been a clown, a clerk, a savior of stray kittens, and a voice actress, but not necessarily in that order. She grew up in a yellow house across from a cornfield, but now she lives in Mexico with her family. She writes all kinds of genre fiction, but she has an eternal soft spot for happily ever after. Yay! All happily ever afters here. That's all we got. Happy ever afters all the time. Thank you for having me. Yay. Okay. So let's start off by talking about your current novels. So we're talking um, The Night and Its Moon. We're talking Wings Once Cursed and Bound. We're talking Boss Witch. We're talking Beast Charmer series. And we're talking Fury Born. So I'm going to just pick somebody at random because there's five of you on my screen and it's great. Uh, Maxim, tell us about the Beast Charmer series. Oh, out the gate right away? Sure. Yeah, go right ahead. Just tell us. Give us, <laughs> give us the elevator pitch. Why should we pick up this book? Well, um, it's adult dark Pokemon meets Assassin's Creed with a little bit of romance. So Shut up and take my money. Yeah, <laughs> basically. And lots yeah. of like, I, I'm a gamer at heart, right? So there's a lot of like Final Fantasy references and like little Easter eggs like that hidden in there. And I mean, like the, the whole pitch is that um, Lena, an exiled beast charmer, is selling creatures on the black market in order to survive, which is a crime against her kind. And so a bounty gets hit on her head or get placed, a hit gets placed on her head. She also gets hit <laughs> in the head a couple of times, but like <laughs> a bounty is placed on her head and the undead assassin of this uh guild the guild master um comes after her and in exchange for her life she promises him four creatures for him and his closest friends so the whole the beginning of the series is them going on this epic journey to tame creatures and as close proximity often results in sexy times that you know kind of leads to other things and the whole series progresses as they uh change their world for the better and there are tons of beasts tons of beasts there's like something like 25 in the first book alone and then it builds every series and there's a bestiary in the back of the book to help keep track so you're basically going for just like the original 150 pokemon just like we yeah 150 if I can, in the series i hope by the end of six i can okay. have at least 100 i don't see how i wouldn't be able to we'll see okay we'll see at this i mean i, I shouldn't promise that that's a tall order <laughs> it is a little bit but that's okay and, keep, and keeping track is a whole different th- story for that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, wait, if I gave this beast this power, couldn't have it have helped them during this plot scene or this scenario? Oh, it's, uh, it's just, it's, yeah, maybe oh, not no. 100. Maybe 75. 75, okay, all right. <laughs> well, we'll see what we can get with 75 and then we can move forward from okay. there. You too. Okay, okay, fabulous. All right, all right, dark Pokemon. I mean, that sounds great. <laughs> okay, moving from Pokemon to witchery and tell us about your latest series. Uh, Fix It Witches is, uh, I would consider it to be almost like a cozy paranormal romance, if that's a thing. Um, Basically, the books are just like a warm hug. You would want to talk about them over coffee with your friends. I did focus on community and sisterhood and fraternity. And um, I did, of course, do the world building as well since I come from a spec fic background, like even my paranormal rom-coms have the world building and most of it is tip of the iceberg type stuff. Like I will have thought of a hundred things in order to reveal one detail. And sometimes it's very disappointing because you, you did all that work and you want people to see the work, but it wouldn't necessarily make sense for 
you to write a scene that's very, as you know, Bob, the two witches discussing the way things work in their society. Like, like who is that scene for? It's obviously not for the two witches who have that intuitive understanding of how politics work, but it's a little frustrating not to be able to include it. Um, I think what I really wanted to do since I wrote these books at a very trying time, shall I say, with there was a lot going on in the world. I just wanted it to be a happy place for people to retreat and a, almost like a safe space of a series. Like when you just have had enough of what the real world is offering and you just want a place where things are happy and the cinnamon rolls are amazing and toxic masculinity really is not a thing. Um, and it, pretty much everyone is bisexual by default. Um, that's, that's who I wrote the books for. And I did kind of bring in a change the world vibe from Extra Witchy. Um, but I don't want to say too much about it because it's not out yet. But there are some pretty exciting developments in there. It, it, there, yes. End of Extra Witchy, everybody, you're gonna, you're gonna love it. So I have to ask you real quick before I move on to my next author, where is the town? In what state is your town? It's in Illinois. Darn it. Sorry. Um, it's uh, about an hour outside of Chicago. Okay. And I mean, geographically, uh, in my mm -hmm. head, it's basically kind of somewhere near Wheaton. Okay. But I, I actually used St. Charles, Illinois, which is a bit farther oh. away. St. Charles. <laughs> Darn it. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, I actually, Main Street. I Mark, actually so. used St. Charles, Illinois as mm -hmm. my inspiration. I looked at a lot of pictures and mm -hmm. they have a really cool river walk and they have a very quaint downtown, oh, but yeah. they also have like theater and nightlife mm -hmm. and some swanky restaurants. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like I tried to vibe it like all the charm of small town, but you're close enough to Chicago that if you really want a big city yeah. thrill that you get in the car or you go to the train station mm -hmm. and, you know, 40 minutes later, you're downtown. So gotcha. um, that's, that's the inspiration for St. Clair. Makes perfect sense. Moving on from one, well, this is kind of like a fake realistic city, but now we get to a real realistic city uh, for Wings, Once Cursed, and Bound. So uh, PJ, tell us about this Thai-inspired fantasy. Well, you know what? It's very kind of, it. I, it's a very urban fantasy slash contemporary fantasy kind of feel to it where it starts in downtown Seattle. You know, you're in the theater area, like right on Pine Street. It's really good foodie area too. There's a good nightlife, you know, and maybe just oops, end up in an alley in the middle of a vampire fight. I don't know. And then you have this issue with having to take said vampire and get him down to the waterfront. Um, you know, and now lately we've had all of these little, um, the zippy, <laughs> like all of these zippy rentable um, scooters. So who's to say anything about you getting cozy, putting two on a scooter, like happens all the time. All right, but vampire. And then we have our heroine who is a dancer, Unfortunately, somebody gifts her something that is a cursed item that's going to kill her. <laughs> so that was a kind of an oops situation. So we are in a scenario where everybody's trying to figure out how to get them off before they kill her. And what they're saying is like it, this cursed item and the idea behind the entire world of Wings, Ones, Cursed and Bound is sort of a Warehouse 13 meets the librarians kind of feel where ultimately across the books, they're running into objects of myth and magic that could potentially cause chaos, but mostly just murder uh, humans of various types. And then you also have paranormals who are running around trying to grab these items and get them out of harm's way. Um, so it's got that kind of zany feel where you just never know what's going to come up. There's a lot of scope for a lot of supernaturals to come up and to delve into a lot of items and objects of myth and magic and folklore and legend and explore them. And one of the things that I always missed about any of these shows is that you get a lot of Greek mythology, you get a lot of Roman mythology, you get a lot of your mermaids. Sometimes they go, ooh, let's go edgy and go with Selkies um, or maybe some Egyptian mythology. But 
you know, and if we're going Asian, we tend to go with the fox demons, which I have a great love for. And even if book one hasn't come out, let me just say fox demons play a big part in book two because I have been on a major K-drama hit, which Anne knows about with me. <laughs> And the, and the Asian drama situation. Um, so Fox Demons do come into play later on. Uh, but what I wanted for this first book was um, to really delve into the Asian diaspora experience and what happens if you're a Thai American and you realize, oh, hey, I'm a throwback in a whole lot of ways. Like I get upset and you know maybe I'm under this curse and I start to sleepwalk in the air with wings hi, I'm a bird princess, and I didn't realize it, you know, so I wanted to dive into the story of what it's like to be a, a bird princess based on a uh, Thai myth of um, Prince Ton and Monora, which is um, uh, the story of Gennady, which are bird people. Oftentimes, people will see these pictures and be like, oh, that's like the Thai version of angels. Not so, friends, not so. Gennady are these magical beings from the Himapan, and there's a whole different mythology. There's a whole different epic romance between Suton and Monora. And like when it comes down to it, she's one of seven bird princesses who came down into the human lands on a moonlit night to go play in the water like birds do. And what do you know, gets captured by a human and taken back and then tends like is taken captive, falls in love with a prince, forgets she's a bird princess, politics ensue, epic who know what sees and armies and, and whatnots ensue. And she ends up offering to sacrifice herself. And she dances in front of a bonfire, remembers she's a bird princess and flies away on the updraft and leaves behind her ring and says, if you really love me, you can come find me on a journey through the Himapon that will take you seven years, seven months, seven weeks, seven days with the help of a monkey, right? Like. <laughs> And that's all the mythology that's already there, which inspired this character. Like, how can you not have rich mythology like that and not have Gennady just floating through all the fantasy everywhere? So I decided to, to, to really center my book on this kind of mythology and exploring it and folklore and legends that I loved growing up. And so that's the origin of it. So we're in the middle of downtown Seattle, but we have we have vampires, we have werewolves, we have a whole bunch of other stuff, friends, from all mythology all around the world. And mm. the idea is that the entire series will touch on various, uh, not only mythology, objects, mm -hmm. and magic, but also story structure and narrative structure from okay. all around the world. I love it. I love all of it. Because just that that amalgamation of all of these incredible mythologies and and, and mythical creatures and and you know all of oh my gosh this is this is great I'm so and excited. me and all the hand wavies like yes all the the hand so many things so oh. many things <laughs> so one of the um one of the different mythological creatures in um in Wings One's Person Bound is the Fae, which pivots us very nicely to Piper who has Faye in The Night and Its Moon. So Piper, give us, tell us about The Night and Its Moon. Yes, come with me. So everything I write is very pro-sex worker. So you're not going to like my books if you aren't sex worker positive. I knew that I wanted yes. to center my story, my series around a sex worker MC, because in fantasy, there are always these throwaway characters. And that's that doesn't fly. But it wasn't until I was reading a YA novel, and I'll take it to the grave what I was reading, but she just was an amazing assassin. And I thought, well, that's stupid. No one just isn't amazing at anything. I'm going to make an assassin. And she's going to have to work really hard for it. And then once I had my combat MC, I just saw two halves could make a whole and I could have a brains and beauty MC and a combat MC. And neither of them would have to sacrifice femininity. We could be these two amazing characters and watch our dual femme protagonists. So this is where we have The Night and It's Moon. Um, Nox and Amaris is my bisexual fantasy series, and we follow these young women, and we world build with them. So they start young, they don't know shit about the world, as none of us do when we're growing up. Um, their world is limited because it's filtered through their homogenous lenses, which is nice because then I don't have to info dump. They know nothing, we know nothing. As their world blows up, um, they're forced to grow and they're forced to understand these bigger things and come into their powers, come into their agency. Um, if you like dragons and fae and sex worker rep and bisexual rep, which is very important to me, uh, morally gray characters, um, I'm confident you'll like this. 
it's 18 plus, but book one is not spicy. It has sex in it. It has sex work character in it, but book two uh, starts to get explicitly spicy and it is a bi series. So some installments are more male, female, or mask femme heavy, like book two. And then book three, we get some of our hot gay girl sex, like the slow burn sapphic payoff we've been waiting for. Like the church burns you if they catch you with a copy of books two or three or three or four, I mean. So um, you know you're reading a good book if the church would burn you. I think yeah. that people should buy the book and just hide it in churches as like a as a very benign form of vandalism. Um, I like it. Plus all four in my series are done. So you're not going to be sitting around waiting for years. I know they're done. It's just oh, like good. sending them to the printer, getting that process done. So all right, the golden rule, right? Be what you want from other authors and like give me all your books immediately. Just, yeah, just have them. I just take them all. Just, yeah, it's great. So yes. speaking, <laughs> yes, all of the books all at once, just dump them on me. My poor husband is in the room. He's like, no, do not. <laughs> okay. All right. Last but not least. Claire, who also has a uh, dual femme protagonist, um, but a thousand years apart in Furyborn. So tell us a little bit about Furyborn and sort of uh, romance, but make it a little bit YA. Okay, so this is Furyborn, the first book in the Imperium trilogy. It's a YA epic fantasy series. I should say, because this is a panel about romance, these books are not romance, capital mm -hmm. R. Happily Ever Afters are not guaranteed. Now, the Middlemas trilogy, which is coming out next year, you mentioned yeah. earlier, the first book is coming out next year. That is capital R romance. So happily ever afters are guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you go into this thinking that it's all going to be happy at the end, you are mistaken. Um, yeah. So just you know, disclaimer. That's that's um, okay. Is there is there is there is there love? Is there love happening in these yes, books? Yes. Good. There are, that's all. I mean. So yeah, there are two very passionate. Well, no, there are more than two very passionate relationships at the center of the story. Um, so this is, I like to pitch this as um, Avatar The Last Airbender meets His Dark Materials meets Game of Thrones, but like without all the gratuitous violence against women. Um, and it is um, about these two young women, Riel and Eliana, who live a thousand years apart, and they each discover that they possess this extraordinary power and that they are perhaps the subjects of this prophecy that says two queens will rise one of blood and one of light, one with the power to save the world, one with the power to destroy it. And they're trying to figure out, okay, I have this power. Am I the good queen or the bad queen? And who gets to decide what good and bad means? And what do we do when people are saying that our fate has already been decided for us? Do we have to accept that or do we have to pursue our own destinies even so? Um, and so this is a very big epic fantasy, lots of world building, two different like storylines a thousand years apart um and the the war is an ancient one between humans and angels so there's a lot of like really sort of cosmic um magic going on and then the middle Mist trilogy which i don't have yet because the first book comes out next year but we did reveal the cover today and i think katie put a link up in the chat and it's also um linked on my website um so that is as you mentioned bridgerton meets the court of thorns and roses is how we pitched it it um, a fantasy romance series about three sisters of a noble magic family who are trying to figure out who or what is destroying the middle mist, this magical barrier that protects their, with their world from the dangerous realm of the old gods. And meanwhile, they're falling in love and like figuring out how to manage their mental wellness and wearing fabulous dresses and attending parties and having really hot sex. And it's like all of my favorite things. And each book was inspired by a different classic romantic ballet. So the first book was inspired by Giselle, the second, the Firebird, and the third, Swan Lake. Um, so it's it's really important to me. You know, Anne was saying that when she wrote um, her books, she wrote it during a very hard time during the pandemic. And I did the same with Middlemas. I conceived it during the mostly during the pandemic and during a really hard professional or personal time for me. And I really wanted it to be my happy place. Like, what are the things that bring me joy? What are the things that if I were in a bookstore, I would see it on the cover and just immediately know that this is a book for me. Um, and one thing that was particularly important was writing about women who live with mental illness still having their happily ever afters. Um, and I think it's important, even in fantasy settings, especially in fantasy settings, to discuss that just as we would in 
a contemporary work of fiction. So that is Middlemist. And just to bring it back to the beginning, not a romance. There is romance in it, but do not expect happily ever afters. Thank you for the for the the warning there, because I know a lot of people are like, but it, but, but happily ever after. Like this is this is what we have, and so no. yeah, no. Well, and, and this to be fair, the, yeah, yeah. To be fair, this was always marketed as like oh yeah, epic fantasy. But oh, yeah. the romances and the relationships are a huge component. So oh, you yeah. will get romantic things. You just. Mm -hmm. Just be prepared. <laughs> oh, well, that, and that's great. We want to make sure that everybody is forewarned for all of the things. We're very excited for Middle Mist. I just looked at the cover. Holy crap. Holy crap. Everybody should go look at the cover of Middle Mist. Okay. So <laughs> thank you all for, for letting, letting the audience know about your books because these, I mean, everybody is adding these to their TBRs right now. Right now, everybody is just smashing the button. You can order them from Main Street Books. You can order them from your local indie. I mean, it's going to be great. We're going to have so much to read in the next coming year. But I want to bring it around to the sex because let's be honest, it's a lot of why we read romance. We like us the sexy times. It's very nice. Um, romance has long been a genre back, especially decades ago, where if it had sex in it, it was not really super consensual because you know that was the only way that a woman was expected to enjoy is if it was no 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 yes but we've encountered this incredible era in the last 10 years of incredibly sex positive romance novels where it doesn't have to be forced it doesn't have to be anything that's unwanted but I secretly do want it but I have to say no because otherwise I'm going to be a slut we're we have all of these heroines who are just like unabashed like yeah sure i'll hop on that dick that sounds great so why is sex positivity important to to the romance genre in general and to you specifically why is it important that your heroines have that kind of sex positive agency and i'm gonna start with piper which piper you oh okay <laughs> <laughs> it's either piper or pj <laughs> okay sorry i'm sorry you, yes sex positivity yeah. yes sex positivity especially especially for for you because your heroines are bisexual mm -hmm. so there's not only this component of you know sex positivity but also this this you know bringing onto the stage and highlighting bisexuality which is of course a lot of the time derided in the lgbt community so bisexuality sex positivity tie it all in perfect so um <laughs> where to where to go we have my sex worker character who mm -hmm. I love using sex as agency and power because in our Madonna whore complex society, it's like, if you use, if, if you're into sex, if you are, if you enjoy sex, if sex is a source of power, then there's something wrong with you. And so her being an empowered, wonderful, brilliant MC was something that was more important to me than anything else. And then our, my other MC is someone who, um, she doesn't necessarily get to lose her V card immediately, but she's trying, she's trying her best. It's not like, oh no, don't touch me. She's like, why won't anyone sleep with me? But for reasons, for plot relevant reasons. Um, and <laughs> part of being bisexual wasn't necessarily, like I never wanted it to be a big deal that they were bi. I didn't want the homophobic uh, conversation to happen. It wasn't like, do I like her because she's a woman? It's just, do I like her because I'm not self-reflective and I haven't thought about these things and other stuff is going on in this high fantasy realm. Things are at stake. I'm fighting the dragon. Like I haven't had time to articulate these feelings. So being able to fold sex in, in ways that um, resonated with the human experience and the fae experience um, and was also empowering and encouraging was super important, whether you were jumping on a dick or if you were other, um, how gross can we be? Um, <laughs> hot gay girl sex yes yes book, one, book one's not super spicy I just gotta like just manage your expectations in the spice okay. book one that's okay, okay. We're, we're awaiting the rest of the spice it's gonna be great Good. all right so no but that's great I mean you have to you you know we we as you know people who love romance and you guys as writers have to make sure that you're bringing into the world the things that you want to see in other people's work so the fact that you are you know not only featuring a sex worker main character and nobody sacrificing femininity in you know in pursuit of you know glory or whatever it is i mean it just it it allows it allows women to see you know we can be a sex worker we can be an assassin but we can still look really fucking hot doing it 
So it's gonna be great, it's gonna be fine. So uh, bisexuality abounds in uh, St. Clair in um, the Fix It Witches series, uh, which is very, very exciting. So and talk sex positivity and talk like all of your fun bisexual heroes because everybody in that town, I'm pretty sure is just, just having a good time. Um, you know, in the very first book we have, um, we have Danica and Titus, and then we move into Boss Witch with, uh, with Clementine. So tell us about, tell us about sex positivity in St. Clair. Um, well, I would say that the first thing that I did was make the older generation more supportive. Yes, I um, noticed that. Instead of having disapproving parents or grandparents who don't understand why the kids have to do that, et cetera, um, I just decided that I didn't want I didn't want that in my fictional world. So if you can write anything, why can't I write elders who are sex positive and supportive and who love you no matter what. I mean, I did include one bad apple um, for the sake of conflict, because if you if you have everyone on the same page, it's a very comforting story, but it's not a very gripping one. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, you have my editor to thank for that because <laughs> I was to the point of, of wanting to just write fluff that like, mm. you know, the worst thing that would happen is that someone gets locked out of their car and they yeah. have to pay $70 to have their key fob replaced. I mean, I, like, I just, I, I was just like, you know, the world is, is difficult enough. Do I really have to punish these characters? Mm -hmm. And my editor was like, I mean, just just a little, little bit. bit. I mean, you need to put some conflict in there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll write a character who's, you know, controlling and she believes a little too strongly in the power of her witchy bloodline. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't want her granddaughters to marry just anyone. They need to marry into a powerful, rich, witch family. And when I say rich, mm -hmm. I mean in power, not necessarily in resources. Um, because this particular character believes that intermingling will weaken your gifts, which actually is not correct. Mm -hmm. She's just wrong about basically everything, which I don't think is a huge spoiler. Um, but in terms of representation, she's yeah. already mentioned that that Titus is by. Um, he's also a virgin because I love was, virgin heroes. He was literally love cursed, which is a bit of a spoiler, but um, you're going to feel so sorry for him if you haven't actually read, which please, um, he's, he's been through a lot. You'll really be rooting for him to get his happy ending. He's and then so of course cute. he is very cute. He just wants to bake you delicious things and That's all. To like to nurture and that type of thing. He, he wants to get a dog roll. with you, dear readers. Yes. He wants to get another dog with you. Yes, he does. He he is a cinnamon roll and he <laughs> makes cinnamon rolls just like he is the cinnamon. It's made. I just went, I just went all in yeah. like, with the cuteness. Yes. 1000%. Did I answer I, the question? Yeah. I feel like you, I you did. It. To no, it was good. This is good though, because it shows a lot of different representations because it isn't like this big giant thing, especially, you know, we, we talk about women a lot in representation and, 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 and in romance novels, but a lot of the time, you know, we have these disparities between women and men where women, you know, they're blushing versions and the men are like, I'm so virile. I've had 18,000 sex partners and here, let me show you how this is done. The fact that we now have the, that it's now acceptable to have a virgin hero in a book, like shut up and take my money. I am super into it. It's great. So thank you for Titus. We appreciate that. He's fabulous and wonderful. And also I now want cinnamon rolls. That's real bad. Okay. <laughs> oh, my husband just looked at me. He's like, cinnamon rolls? What? <laughs> okay. So uh, Claire, talk sex positivity in your new series, because obviously YA is a little bit of a gray area for, for, for sex and romance. You know, you kind of have to walk a fine line, but in Middle Mist, you can just go for it. Like, tell us about the sex positivity and the representation in Middle Mist. Claire, are you there? She's got a little bit of a mute. Oh. Can she hear us? I don't know. Claire, can you hear us? 
her audio is acting out according to oh, her audio is acting. Oh, sorry, dude. Okay. I will, I'll move on to Maxim and then I'll go back to Claire. Okay. All right. So Maxim, tell us about sex positive. I mean, obviously we have, you know, this now this new epic fantasy, like epic fantasy setting and beasts and all sorts of good stuff, but how do you bring the sex positivity into a world where there's so much else going on? So for me, it was really important for it to just be like, it wasn't, it, uh, so I have bisexual characters um, mm-hmm. yeah. and it, it just is, it's not, and gay characters. And it's just a thing that is exists, right? It's not like something that has to be dissected because people like that exist and not their, their mm-hmm. queerness doesn't have to be put on display for it to be a real thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I wanted, you know, that to just sort of be part of Knox um, intrinsic background and Knox story mm-hmm. and his experience with bisexuality and his progression to being with Lena is mm-hmm. is similar to mine in that I had a really hard time with some of the bi erasure that happened right. yeah. um, around readerships in my books and people being upset that he ended up with a female character. And that really, really hurt me, like on a deep, true, intrinsic level to the point where I'm not asking anyone to go out and like go find like these readers. Everyone's entitled to their own experience, right? But it's like, holy shit, like I'm by and that hurts because I'm in a heteronormative relationship. And Nock is, because he ends up with Lena, doesn't negate the fact that he was with a man prior to Lena. And then Lena is just open. And then I have cost and his love interest in book four. And it's like, they just exist. I want them to exist and I want it to be positive and beautiful. And like, mm-hmm. they go through so many other trials and tribulations within the story and the plot line itself. Yeah. Their sexuality shouldn't be the thing that causes mm-hmm. strife for them. Right. 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 They, they're people, right? Like I'm people. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I think I had this, this, discussion briefly with Piper when I saw her last is like this bi erasure is so hard to deal with it is. and whether it's represented in a man or a woman or someone else yeah. non-binary however you want to approach that however you are who you are your identity right. mm-hmm. shouldn't be called into question just because of who you end up with or who you choose to have fun with under the sheets so <laughs> or thank you for table, that yeah or, you or... Know, <laughs> on a library desk or you know <laughs> in the wherever air. else in the air in the air in the middle of the air yeah. while you're flying wherever yeah. else you decide to to make your make your sweet sweet love it's yeah, yeah. doesn't matter doesn't matter who it's yeah. with doesn't matter what's going on one thousand yeah. percent and yeah. I mean and like <laughs> yeah for 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 knock and Lena the other thing that was super important to me because right this started with kingdom of exiles this is the first book is yeah. like it sounds like someone I can't remember who said it someone else said love curse that's their virgin. Their oh, virgin it was, it was, it was, Anne, yeah. Anne. yeah. So knock has a love curse too. So when they choose to mm-hmm. finally like be together, it's all about choice and their internal agency and the mm-hmm. risk that they both accept as individuals. Right. Mm-hmm. So 100%. That's how I, I did it. it. <laughs> Yay. Well, yeah. thank you for that. Thank you. Th- thanks to everybody on this panel mm-hmm. who is writing really great, really strong, really really determined bisexual characters, because we do see that kind of bi erasure a lot, you know, and we want to make sure that, um, you know, we see ourselves in, you know, in these relationships, whether it's, whether it's a hetero passing relationship, whether it's a, you know, a gay relationship, it doesn't matter. We just want to make sure that, you know, something reflects what we, what, you know, what we're doing in our own lives. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful to, to all of you for that. So Claire, you're back with us after your, after your wonky, wonky audio. I'm sorry about that. Um, tell us about sex positivity in the Middle Miss trilogy. Obviously, glorious dresses, dancing, epic romance, et cetera, et cetera, but also sex positivity. So tell us how you brought that to the forefront of this um, Regency-inspired fantasy. Well, first of all, um, yeah. I think Anne was raising her hand. Did Anne, yeah. did Anne have something that she wanted? Oh, to- sorry, Anne. Did you have something that you needed to... Oh, I didn't want to speak over Claire since she didn't get a chance to 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 express herself. But um, since she's kindly offering, um, yeah, I was just going to weigh in and say I have actually experienced the bi erasure too in my books. The really? number the number one criticism, like mm-hmm. they will say that Titus is not actually bi because he's never been with a dude since he's a virgin and his first experience was with a woman, and now he's 
presumably in a serious relationship with a woman that he can't actually say he's bi. Um, um, yeah. Excuse me, he tried his hardest. <laughs> That damn curse. Oh, he, like, he, did, he did. There is a mention of a very awkward scene where he was making out with another boy and they got the knock, knock, knock on the window from the cops. Yeah. Um, so like, so much. like he didn't, he didn't succeed, but he did really try his best. He did try um, his best. He tried and, so I mean, That's the kind of criticism that you get. Like if they haven't actually, if the character hasn't actually been in a serious relationship, then they don't get to carry their buy card like it's not actually valid doesn't count and that 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 is a little hurtful to people who for whatever reason have are in that situation so they're not like they're not actually valid bisexuals like which, which doesn't even yeah yeah no that makes perfect sense thank you for that and that that is it's an excellent point and it is absolutely frustrating to to see so we're very happy that everybody's sort of bringing this to the forefront and we just need to continue to champion like you are if you are a valid bisexual regardless of who you've been with regardless of who you're with now regardless of what experience you have if you're bi you're bi that's it that's how it goes so sorry about it okay <laughs> now sex positive regency inspired fantasy with cool spiky crowns on the cover go claire Yes. Um, so I'm going to speak to Metal Mist and to Furyborn just yeah. because the Imperium trilogy is out there and it's mm -hmm. ready to read. Um, you should go read it. And you should, I mean, in my unbiased opinion. Um, but so one thing that I use as my guiding light, both when writing the Imperium trilogy and now as I'm working on the Metal Mist trilogy, is thinking about the kind of sex positivity that I needed to see as a young woman. Um, when I was in middle school, high school, and I was starting to have um, my first sexual attractions to people. And, um, and I was starting to explore things like masturbation. And I was starting to explore things like, well, well, who do I actually desire? Do I desire like the kind of people that I've been told all my life I should desire? Or do I desire different kind of people? Do I desire, you know, trying to answer all of those questions without a lot of guidance. Um, I grew up in Texas and there's great food there, great people, but I did not receive really any sex education and, um, and, you know, no shade to my parents that that's how they grew up too. So they didn't really know how to do that. And so I had to figure out a lot of things on my own. So, um, I think about, okay, that girl who was overwhelmed with all of these feelings and didn't know how to deal with them and didn't have really any guidance as to how to process them and accept them and who felt a lot of shame therefore because of it. How do I write books that she would have been glad to find, books that would have helped her? Um, in the Imperium trilogy, you know, the characters are Riel and Eliana, the MCs, they are teenagers, but, um, you know, I, I think that it's okay to write about teens having sex because teens do have sex. And I wish that I had read, you know, this giant, big, rich fantasy book with teens having sex as a kid, I would have felt so seen. And so like, I don't know, it would have just helped me so much figure out who I was and what I wanted. Similarly with the Middle Miss trilogy, the characters are adults, but again, like what is the kind of adult fantasy that I would have wanted to see as a kid? Female centric, Fem um, it's all about female pleasure, female consent. It's about um, it's about relationships that are rich and complicated, and it's about sort of blatant, not blatant. I don't know if that's the right word, but just unabashed sexuality. People are in touch with their bodies. They're in touch with what they like, what they don't. They're not afraid to say it. They masturbate. They fantasize. They um, are they love their bodies and how they can um, express their sexuality with their bodies. Like these are the things I wanted to see when I was a, a young person and I didn't. So I'm always thinking about that um, and portraying that kind of sex positivity in my books, both young adult and adult. And that is super, super important. We see a lot of, you know, a lot of chatter about like how we shouldn't, you know, the abstinence only sex education, we shouldn't teach teens how to have sex, all this other stuff, but like, it's gonna happen. It's the thing that happens. It's happened since the dawn of time. So why not, if you know, why not portray healthy consensual relationships in in young adults? You know, and that's been a huge issue for me as a bookseller because parents don't want any kind of sexuality at all in their young adult novels. But 
like if the, it, it is helpful for teenagers to see something portrayed that's healthy as opposed to not knowing what the hell is 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 happening and having maybe bad examples from television or bad examples from their own life or something like that. So positive and consensual and healthy relationships in YA that and you know end up ending you know involving sex I think is just extremely important. So um and also sex is great and epic fantasy. So yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. And just just really quick, I know yeah. I don't want really to talk too long, but I also think it's important, especially in literature for young people to include relationships that aren't good. Yes, um, and yes sexual, you are correct. Uh, sexual power dynamics that aren't good mm-hmm. and, you know, provide them a safe place to explore situations like that and how they feel right. about that and how they would respond to it, how the characters mm-hmm. are responding to it. So mm-hmm. that's important as well. Right. And it helps teens with those experiences feel seen because, oh, wait, I, if I'm not in this healthy relationship, like, is this wrong? Like, but if you see something portrayed, like, oh, this is something that, that I'm having a problem with, maybe, you know, maybe it's something I need to get help with. Maybe it's something I need to get out of. So you're exactly correct in that, Claire. So thank you for that. All right. PJ. Sex in the air, positive sex in the air. <laughs> sex. I mean, like, obviously there's, you know, very exciting, like sexual encounters in your book that, that aren't, aren't in the air, but also just tell us about sex positivity. Tell us about, um, tell us about how that made its way into Wings Once Cursed and Bound. I think a lot of what uh, my fellow authors here are talking about uh, when it comes to sexual orientation and exploring mm-hmm. that, um, is a lot more subtle in Wings One's Curse and Bound. And that yeah. is also reflective of my personal experience as I was okay. writing and exploring. Uh, because I mean, I'm on interview earlier on in my author career. And the fact that I really love all my friends that are writing queer experiences and inclusive queer, um, but also trying to be really careful because like mm-hmm. the joke amongst my friends is that I'm I'm aggressively heterosexual, which a couple of my friends called out and said, but are you really? I read your books. <laughs> And, and it was one of those things where it reminded me of when uh, a photographer, a friend of mine had come out years ago, decades ago. And she said, um, do you still feel comfortable doing photo shoots with me? And I'm like, I kind of thought you were already out because, you know, when you're a photographer, the photos you take are how you view the world. And I have never had anyone take photos of me that are more beautiful and more sexually appealing and make me feel beautiful and sexually attractive especially at a time when I was really not good with my own body positivity. So I kind of thought she was already out. Like I knew. (laughs) And so a lot of my friends have read my stuff and they're like, you find your own, all of your own characters quite attractive. So are you sure you are heterosexual? I'm like, you know, I don't know. And my sister's like, I don't know. Cause you know, she's, she has been by and out since her college days. And so she's like, I was just waiting for you to figure it out. Right. (laughs) So it's one of those things where it's much more subtle in Wings Once Cursed and Bound, and that's okay. Where it comes out more uh, when it comes to sex positivity for me is more about my characters exploring their fantasies and about encouraging communication with their partners about what they want, what they need. Hey, this is going to be a little different. Are you comfortable with this? Can, are, you, are you cool with this? And also about my characters enjoying the sensations in their bodies. And sometimes the the relationship arc is developing and moving forward. That romance is developing and moving forward because they're building trust to be able to let each other know what the sensations are. Is this good? Is this good? More of this, less of this. And having the courage to ask and say, I want more of this rather than just hoping that they're kind of gonna figure it out as we go because sex is messy. And unless you happen to be writing empaths and telepaths, the communication of more of this or no nope, oh, poked in an awkward spot there, right? Or like, no, that is not actually my G spot, right? Like, like not everybody's gonna know exactly how to find that, right? Or yes, I love it when you bump the hell out of my cervix or no, I don't. You know, it, those kinds of communications, and, and that can happen regardless of partners and combinations, right? Like it can happen through a lot of modalities. Right? Um, it's something that's really positive to be able to communicate. And it's a reflection of the relationship and the romance and how comfortable you are with your partner and how much you trust them to be able to feedback, especially if you have a history of other partners who didn't care 
or you didn't really apply with yourself. So you don't know how to do that, right? Like some people don't realize that the really, really sensitive skin behind their knee or on the inside of their elbow or just under their ribs is an erogenous zone. They're like, what? You don't just touch the button and things happen. You don't just pinch the things and things happen. You mean you can also like pet just underneath the scrotum there and it's like a really good, happy feeling? Like exploring that I think is a lot of really good sex positivity too. And that communication is super healthy. Um, and it shows the trust building between the characters if across the scenes you have a progression of how much they can communicate with each other and they don't automatically know how to each other, like they're exploring their bodies as well as they're exploring their emotions. Um, and you know, one thing I love about romance is that no matter when you come into romance, like I started writing Hanky Panky when I was in third grade with oh. a very, very not good um, set. Like I was reading Slave Girl of Gore by Tyrell Cabot. That's not really the female lens, okay? <laughs> right, like in third not grade. Really. Um, but you had, but so, it, you know, to, to offset that, I had a couple of people introduce me to more positive um, representations. Romance really, really pushes the safer sex and the consent and introduces it in this natural way where you find that it doesn't ruin the mood, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't throw me out of the story. In fact, it's incredibly sexy. I love that it's sexy, that consent is not only a thing at the beginning, but it is a continual thing with check-ins throughout the course of, hey, do you still feel comfortable? Hey, you can walk away from this at any moment. Hey, it's okay if you're not comfortable with this. This yeah. will go as far as you want it to go. And that communication back and forth between all of the participants in the room, no matter how many participants there are, anybody can go as far as they feel comfortable or mm -hmm. step back or even leave the situation if they're uncomfortable. Yeah. And I love writing stories like that, yeah. you know? So that's where sex positivity is really important yes. for me. And what I'm trying to continue to include in my books more and more moving mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. I, just, I, I see every single person, every single head, we are all nodding. We're all like, oh my gosh, this is great. This is amazing. You are all just on the absolute forefront of this incredible sex positivity wave. Even in the last 10 years, you know, it's only been in the last, I would say five or six that I've even seen those check-ins throughout the course of the sex scene. Those, you know, those, you know, tell me yes, tell me no, tell me what you want. I just, I love those inclusions because that just, it makes it, you're exactly correct. It makes it so much sexier. It's like, okay, everybody's here. Everybody's a part of this. Go, good. I do have to say, I winced a little bit when you talked about bumping cervixes, though. That was a little bit, that was a lot. No, it's for some people and it's not for other people. No, correct. <laughs> yes, absolutely correct. There's a lot going on there. <laughs> Especially now, none, none of you write monster romances, but there's monster romance wave coming and that's, that happens, that happens. Okay, I mean, need Katie on this panel. I know, oh, where's Katie? Where's like, Katie? oh my God, I'm moderating Katie on Sunday. Are you really? I oh am. My gosh. And yeah, see, I can't wait. You have to understand, like Katie and I have discussed hemipene and we have also discussed <laughs> prehensile. So that's going to come up in the panel. So if any of you are attending is... Emerald City Comic Con Sunday oh in the afternoon, it's on. <laughs> and I'm a moderator, so I get to oh control my God. The, those questions. <laughs> and does have aliens. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, no, it. Yeah, no. Katie put out a like put out a tweet about how like now her editor was like, so what's special about this Kraken's penis? And everybody's like prehensile now she's like i didn't think about it but now it's prehensile so it's fine it makes Wrong sense because like, it's a kraken like seriously yeah, do you know totally how squids sense. make out like i mean her dragon has two penises that's fine it's great i'm interested in what's going to happen with the gargoyle later but we're not talking about katie robert we love katie robert but we'll not move to along. say that like friends everyone is queer in katie robert's story just yeah. assume everyone's <laughs> just assume. queer <laughs> My husband's off in the in the other in the other part of the room. He's like, but the gargoyle's penis is just going to be rock hard. That's what's going to happen. So when? Oh, when? I, I when? I don't know, when? man. But I when? Mean, but when? And I'm sorry. I will challenge that with the fact that a there are glass dildos out there, and b there with the are. twilight with the twilight phase years mm -hmm. ago. There mm -hmm. was the one that you stuck in the freezer that was also oh, scary. Why would you do one? that? I don't know. But some no. people liked it. Like it was one that you stuck in the freezer. And then you did the things with it. <laughs> Razor dildos. Yes. Whatever you wanted to do. And it glittered. It did glitter. It glittered. <laughs> it glittered. Serious? I was, I was at obviously... an anime con in Boston when this oh one came out. And someone had brought it with them. 
So <laughs> look, the after dark panels are the place to go for cons. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. 1000%. Ones oh that my require goodness. the 18 plus band. Yeah, I feel I like am. I missed an entire subset of the last con I went to. <laughs> <laughs> That's just it makes like me want to go to a con. I used to run. I used to run an eighteen plus um, ladies <gasps> guide to hentai for sex positive <gasps> hentai for ladies, yes. and at Otakon like three years straight, and I mm-hmm. I ran it in a corset with foxtails. All right, like so, friends, <laughs> but it was all sex positive anime because too Excellent. many too many of my younger memories are of like snickering people like showing you some anime that is like so incredibly traumatic mm-hmm. and terribly a lot of traumatic anime. There's there. a lot of traumatic right? anime. Why and so, though? and so my panel was about sex positive girls choice, hankity mm-hmm. pankity. Like, and at that time I knew less about the discourse. And so I have to admit, like, I wasn't as, as good about uh, maintaining respect for non-binary examples mm-hmm. of, yeah of anime and hentai. So if I were to ever do that panel again, obviously it's on. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I will do better. <laughs> so th- I mean, like there's so much good information coming out of all of your brains right now. And I just, I honestly wish this lasted for another like three hours because we could talk about absolutely everything. So I want to, I'm not sure I, Katie can tell us, I, mean, I guess how much longer we have or how long we're allowed to talk or whatever it is. I know it's like, four minutes to eight, but, or to whatever time it is in your area. Thank you for joining us. But how, what are some of your, like, not nobody in this room work, but what are some of your favorite current examples of like, this is a great representative, body positive, sex positive book. What are you reading right now that you wanted to share with the world? That's, that is sort of in these, you know, has this like wonderful body positive edict because there's so much out there that we want to explore as romance readers. We want things that are, that are positive. We want things that are sexy. We want things that are like gonna like make us feel all the feelings, but also like don't make us feel like shit because there's, you know, bad things happening. So what, what are some of the things that you would like to, that you would like to share with the panel or with the uh, audience? You guys are the panel, the attendees are over there. Okay. What do you got? (laughs) <laughs> PJ, obviously you have something to say to us. So what do you have? What do you I mean? Share? All right. Shout out to Iron Widow. Is yes. it Zero Jojo? Because yes. what I love about her and her TikTok game is strong. All right. What I love about her, is she's like, I'm not here for the love triangle. I am here for the why not both. And yes, being again, we mentioned I'm a K-drama girl and an Asian drama yeah. girl. And yeah. second lead syndrome breaks my heart every <laughs> show. So why not both? I'm here for the why not both. Can we have the why not both? And I would love, and so Iron Widow is amazing for that. It's not technically romance, but there is a really strong romantic element that is central to the plot. Um, And it is a poly uh, romance, which is so much. Oh, I'm so Mm -hmm. sorry. I should correct myself. Uh, Zeron uses they, them. So Mm -hmm. I apologize for that. Um, Want to get the pronouns correct. But yeah, so shout out for Iron Widow. And then we did mention Katie Robert and- Let's just say anything from the Dark Olympus series, anything from the Wicked Villain series, anything from the monster, I'm sorry, the Dragon Bride starts with the Dragon Bride. I forget what the series name is. Deal with the demon, deal with the demon. Deal with the demons. Um, And also her taboo series, like seriously, all of it is really sex positive. It's also everybody in there just assume they're queer. Um, But also it is, it is just also very, very careful solid positive representation of kink mm-hmm. lifestyle for any of the yes. books that have kink elements which yes. you know I got get a little worried when there are books out there that dive into kink because it is a, a gorgeous gorgeous fantasy mm-hmm. that some people want to learn more about but there are bad examples out there and so people end up yeah. in dangerous situations so yeah. I can really strongly say hey Katie does some really positive examples so that if people are curious and looking to explore Mm -hmm. those will not lead you astray into a dangerous situation they will not they're fabulous yeah if if you look if you want to explore kink in a in a mildly safe setting your heart won't be safe but everything else will be safe i mean (laughs) your heart will get put back into your body but she will rip it out first stop it on the floor maybe a a dragon will run away with it and then like it will get put back into your heart before the end of into your chest before the end of the book you'll be all right (laughs) you won't be the same but you'll be all right Okay. Any other, any other recommendations that you guys just want to like throw out there to the audience? I love Kingdom of Battle and Blood by Scarlet. 
Ah, yes. Ooh, yes, King of fantastic. Battle and Blood. I love the, um, the nonchalant positive positivity around female masturbation in that one it's so yes just and it's just it just happens and it's beautiful Mm -hmm. and it's great and they also have sex so early and it's great so early (laughs) so early it's like her scarlet's whole goal is to get them to have sex as fast as possible it's amazing yeah there, uh, the the fastest orgasm I've ever seen is a Beverly Jenkins book. I think there's an oh, orgasm well, like yeah, Miss one. Yeah, but you, uh, Miss, I mean, like Miss Beth Miss can do Beth. anything. She's amazing. she can she one thousand percent she can do anything. But like, I absolutely am one thousand percent in favor of the goal of having the first sex like as early as possible. So yeah, that's all. I mean, and there is something to be said for a good slow burn. But I was gonna say, which is funny because I can't do it. Like all of mine are slow burn. Like oh yeah, <laughs> I make you wait for that. But I love it when I get to read it right away. Yeah, always very fun. We were talking about kink a second ago, so I was just yeah. I this is so tacky. In my books, um, I really enjoyed showing the birth of kink, like the first yes. moment where she was like, "Oh my god, that was why did I like that?" Because yeah. in a lot of the books that I've consumed and things that I've read and things that I enjoy, I'm already like thrown into an established kink, and so the very first unlocking of kink and role and dynamic in the community was really fun to explore but um I've just been on a writing binge so I can't wait to start reading again <laughs> yeah it's do you guys do you guys read romance while you write romance yes read romance I, while you write romance I usually read a different subgenre of romance okay. than I'm writing right now so if I'm writing right now fantasy then I'm usually reading like sci-fi romance or I'm reading historical romance mm-hmm. just so I don't, don't accidentally pick up something right? right because like just want to make sure but at the other time when I'm taking a break I'm I'm mm-hmm. all for going and reading because there's a reason why I love that subgenre yeah so yeah that makes sense and do you read romance while you write romance I do exactly what PJ does. Okay. Uh, If I'm writing a paranormal romance, then I will stay away from paranormal romances, but I'll read sci-fi romance. I'll Mm -hmm. read fantasy romance. Mm -hmm. I'll read contemporaries. Gotcha. I, it's actually pretty rare for me to read anything that's not romance. I will sometimes read cozy mysteries or I'll read soft science fiction Mm -hmm. um, or I'll read nonfiction if it's like a research, like something I'm delving into for a topic tackle in one of my books um but I really these days need the happy ending uh if I go into another genre Mm -hmm. I will like scour the warnings and be like how depressed is this book gonna yeah. make me on a scale of one to ten? I do Am the same I not thing. Be able to write for two weeks after I read this because I'm just yeah. so sad. Like it's hard enough to write anyway. Yeah. I can't. I can't take the extra. Yeah, I have to check with friends. I had to check and make sure that Murderbot wasn't gonna wreck me before I read like the novel this big. And I was like, okay, is this okay? Like, is anybody who dies? Like, tell me who dies, and then we can move forward. Murderbot's very good, by the way. Um. Recommend more recommendations. What? So bad at that? What, so bad at that? I, no, no, no. Animes are. I remember oh, God, getting yeah. all the Oh way my gosh, to, animes are so bad at that. I was so bad at that. And I remember <sighs> do do this? to this day, I have not watched the last episode of Iron Blooded Orphans. <laughs> because yeah. I know the, that I know what's gonna happen and I don't want to commit to that being yeah. the reality yeah. of that show. <laughs> Understand. I I still do so not like time. turning a the ending of Trigon. The ending of Trigon still <gasps> oh, me off also to fair. this day. So and Bash also like if you're a big romance heart, person, but, yeah, like committing to fairy tale and yeah. still, still, I can't. I know they're bringing it back, but I, I thousands I don't know. of hours. I have to admit that Fruits Basket, the second oh. remake, did justice to the story yes. in a way that the first ra- round of Fruits Basket yep. did not. No, first round of Fruits Basket was terrible. I was dissatisfied with the first yes. round of Fruits Basket. Same. The second round. <sighs> manga is just, anything for I, yeah. anything for him yeah I have all 23 volumes of that damn manga somewhere oh, in a box so in good. my house it's so good anyway okay <laughs> Claire uh what what are you what are you pushing out to everybody right now or answer the question do you read what do you read while you write both questions you can answer both questions well this kind of answers both questions just really yeah. quickly I've honestly had a really hard time reading the last couple of years. really um, okay yeah um 
I don't know if it's because my feelings about writing have been very complicated the last couple of years. And so reading just reminds me of writing and work and there's all kinds of weird fraught emotional things happening there. Um, but I have started reading the, the Dark Olympus. I was gonna, so seconding the Katie Robert uh, mm -hmm. presentation. Um, but yeah, I've had a really hard time reading. Um, and when I do read, it's not at all what I write. You know, it's like really um, easy to read fast paced, like, thrillers you know just like that's my sort of escapism I guess when I do actually read these days mm -hmm. um, but I'm trying to think of like the last one I read I, I've had a really hard time reading like just I'll, I'll be yeah. honest and it feels like somehow wrong to say that but I've had a really hard time with it it I don't know there are lots of yeah. emotional things going on there instead I just watched reruns of the Great British Bake Off um, yes <laughs> <laughs> and um and that's my like happy place. Um, but I'm hoping, I don't know, maybe eventually I'll get back into reading as much as I once did. Mm -hmm. I started oh, yeah. some Robert is for the same reason. Yeah. Uh, but the Dark Olympus books are, are oh, yeah. great. Um, she'll, she'll suck you in. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I've definitely noticed that with a lot of people, a lot of, you know, people that come into the bookstore, they say, well, I just, I haven't been able to read lately. So, you know, tell me something that, you know, tell me something that's going to, gonna reignite my love and unfortunately most of those people don't read romance so I can't throw your books at them but you know they um contemporary yeah. fantasy fantasy romance yeah. just mm -hmm. it's fantasy yeah it's great this is good it's fine consider You'll it love a portal it. it's it's a portal into it it's a gateway it a portal. into a whole new genre just come with me <laughs> come with me into the into the land of fantasy romance you, I mean, like, I am in complete admiration of all of you because I do not understand. I'm, I do not understand how you keep your world building straight, how you keep all your characters straight, how you keep your plot line straight, especially over multiple books. Piper, you have four books written already that are, that are about to, that are about to come out. Uh, Maxim, you're working on, on, on six books. There's going to be six in the series. Claire, you have a whole ass other trilogy coming out. Piper or PJ, how many books are going to be in, in your series? You know, at Do least see? three, maybe At least three. More. Okay. We'll see. It okay. depends on, on how much love. Yeah. How much love, okay. right? But so much love. Everybody three. order wings once cursed and bound. <laughs> it is up. Do it. It's up for pre-order now. It's coming out yes. in April, but it is yes, up it for pre-order now. And okay. I plan on doing a lot of bonus like sneak okay. in my newsletter. Ooh, so okay. friends, all right. Including sign up recipes. for sign up for PJ. Ooh, sign up for PJ's newsletter. You get recipes. Yeah, there's definitely lots of good food in that book. Um, I mean, and how many great British Bake Off? Like I one know, of my right? characters is like, you know, Selassie's got a great voice. I love Selassie. <laughs> I love Selassie. <laughs> <Same. laughs> Selassie so much. There might be just a little bit of a plot bunny going on there. <laughs> yes, I'm one thousand percent in favor of this. Shut up and take it. It's gonna be great. <laughs> um, and how many Fix It Witches books are you planning on? I know three. Three are well. Three is about to come out. Books one and two are out. How many more do you have planned? I want to see all of the witches in the coven. Um, the the trilogy is done at three. Um, I guess if the series really takes off, mm -hmm. we might. I might write more at some mm -hmm. point but the readers okay. really drive that I mean yeah the books have done yes, well did. but but like I came to the end of the story arc that I had in mm -hmm. mind my okay. goal was never to write about the witches until I had given a romance mm -hmm. to literally everyone in the coven uh -huh. um I had I had a certain world changing event okay. that I wanted to work towards yeah like they are all standalone romances but mm -hmm. All my romances also usually have an overarching world event mm -hmm. that I'm working toward. Um, so in the Fix It Witches, I do that in book three and I consider it complete. If the books were to explode and suddenly become wildly profitable and readers are screaming at source books, please, please, we need more witches. I mean, I would not say that I would never do that, but for right now, um, I am content with where we are. That said, I am revising a book that is that takes place in the same persistent world. It is set in St. Clair, and it's, mm -hmm. it, it occurs uh, some years after the events of Extra Witchy. After, well, I can't tell you that. That's a huge spoiler. Okay. After the exciting world event, um, and it's called The Only Purple House in Town. The acronym is Top Hit, which is kind of great and unintentional. 
And so you do have that to look forward to. It's a standalone, it's misfits, found family, um, also a romance, mm -hmm. but with a side of sweetness and coziness with um, even more lovable elderly characters doing shenanigans that elderly people normally wouldn't do, like being vicarious um, or starting a business. So it's here it's, for it's late fun. stage of life, like mm -hmm. shenanigans <laughs> and friskiness. Yes, it's a super fun book. And if anyone who loves the Fix It Witches will probably love it as well. Gotcha. All right, we are fully looking forward to that. Okay. It is 10 minutes past. Katie said she'd stay till 10 minutes. So I, you know, want to be respectful of everybody's time and of her time. Um, this has been an incredible panel. Thank you all so much for, for hanging out with us on a Friday night. Thank you to all of our attendees who have joined us from all the corners of the world to talk about uh, sex positivity and uh, excellent representation in fantasy romance. We are just so incredibly pleased that you were here. Uh, everybody is more than welcome. Um, to add all of these books to their TBR. Please read them all. They're all fabulous authors. All the books they've ever written up until now, you absolutely 1000% should read them because they're fabulous and wonderful. And we look forward to all of your new books coming out in the future. So thank you all very much for attending this evening. Thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. I hope you guys have a great rest of your evening and uh, <laughs> dogs and <laughs> much luck with <laughs> the rest of your writing uh, tonight, this weekend, and for the rest of the year. Everyone, thank you very much. Have a fabulous, wonderful time. Go to Bookstore Romance Day panels tomorrow. There's so many good panels. Check in your local area for signings. Check for virtual events. You can look on the Bookstore Romance Day website to find all of those super awesome panels. And that's my pitch for Bookstore Romance Day. Happy Bookstore Romance Day, Eve. Thank you all very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>